Hi, good evening. Thanks you for everybody that came out this evening. Uh, I really appreciate you taking your time out of what I know is a busy schedule to uh, listen to somebody who's running for office kind of talk about um, their candidacy and what they're looking to do. Um, I truly believe that this is one of the most important elections that we're having in Lewis County this year. Uh, this is a 10 year term, um, so it's going to affect the direction of all of the courts in Lewis County for the next 10 years. So I think it's a uh, significant decision that the voters of Lewis County have to weigh very carefully. And I really appreciate uh, all of you coming out. Anybody who's watching online uh, or will watch in the future, I really appreciate uh, everybody taking the time. The first thing I wanted to do was kind of tell everybody a little bit about myself. I know a lot of people, it's a small community, a lot of people know uh, decent amount about me already, but I want to kind of give everybody the full story first. Uh, I was born and raised right here in Lewis County. I grew up on a dairy farm over in Beaver Falls. It's a fifth generation dairy farm that's being operated. Uh, it's been operated since 1852. Um, my parents are not here tonight because my mom and dad are milking cows right as, we're, as I'm speaking and you're listening to me. So they're still operating that dairy farm. It was a great way to grow up as a child. Uh, I worked every day side by side with my parents and my grandfather who was, it was, I can't imagine a better way to grow up than learning life lessons from them in every day and, and learning how to get up early, work all through the day, work hard and, and do the best at everything that you could do. And I graduated from Beaver River. Um, after I graduated from Beaver River, um, I wanted to go to college and my dad wanted me to go to college very close to home, so being a son who maybe didn't listen as well as I should have, I decided to go to college in Florida. Um, I can't believe that my parents agreed to let me go to college down there, but they did. Uh, it all worked out. I graduated, um, got into Georgetown for law school, uh, wanted to become a lawyer, and sort of accidentally through classes and circumstances, uh, found that with my law degree, I really wanted to serve the public. I wanted to help the community in some way. And when I got out of law school, I really wanted to go to work as an assistant district attorney. Uh, lucky for me, after I had graduated law school and only been out for a relatively short amount of time, I was given an opportunity to work here in Lewis County as an assistant district attorney. Um, I still to this day am a little surprised that District Attorney Mosier took a chance on uh, a fairly new attorney who didn't really know that much about New York prosecution, having not went to a New York State school, but she did. And I worked from about 2008 to about 2000, the end of 2013 as an assistant district attorney right here in Lewis County. I gained a ton of experience working in the local courts, um, everywhere from Lewis County Criminal Court. Uh, to Osceola and all the way up in town of Diana, covering all those courts, handling all the misdemeanors, violations that come through there, as well as felony cases in county court. Uh, at the end of 2013, I was able to uh, gain a position uh, with the uh, United States Attorney's Office in Buffalo. I was assigned to the Narcotics Organized uh, Gang Unit. Uh, so I focused prosecution on those two areas. Uh, while I was a member of the U.S. Attorney's Office, I prosecuted uh, doctors for writing fraudulent scripts for fentanyl, motorcycle gang for committing various RICO offenses, and a number of violent street gangs who were engaged in organized crime. Uh, come 2016, uh, I really needed to make a relocation change due to family circumstances. Um, and I was able to get a position in the Onondaga County District Attorney's Office in about the middle of 2016. Uh, getting that job, uh, no offense to District Attorney Mosher, was the absolute best job that I have ever gotten. Uh, there is no job that has given me more uh, than that job uh, because that's where I met my wife, Courtney. Um, she was here to tell you I was not the most popular member of the uh, violent felony unit when I came into that organization. Um, but ultimately, uh, I was promoted to bureau chief where I ran the investigation unit, and that was a unit that focused on 
uh, narcotics, organized gang activity, and we also handle narcotics-related homicides, which I prosecuted. So that's kind of my experience. And then in 2021, um, I always wanted to finish my legal career here in Lewis County, and in 2021, uh, District Attorney Moser again had an opening. Um, I was selected to work in the office again. Uh, she told me that I was the only one who applied, but um, <laughs> you know, I guess that'll be one of those things that we can dispute. Uh, so I was lucky and I was able to return to Lewis County sooner than I had hoped. Uh, since I've been back, I've been focusing on not only handling cases in the town courts, uh, but also the felonies that have arisen in, in Lewis County. Uh, most recently, uh, prosecuting Sean Expert for the uh, double homicide arson case uh, in March of this year that resulted in a successful prosecution. Um, and we, we, the district attorney's office, we got a very good result in that. So that's a little bit about me. Um, uh, personally, I've already kind of pointed out I'm married. I have two children. Um, so that's kind of the end of my little bio. Um, next thing that I'm sure you guys are wondering is why I'm running. And what I've been telling voters when I've been going door to door is one of the biggest reasons why I'm running is changes in our bail reform statutes is one of the biggest things driving my uh, campaign. I think that the changes that were made in April of 2019 to bail reform have made us fundamentally less safe as a community. Um, and I think while we continue to revisit those sometimes in the legislature, um, their effects have been long lasting in our community and I think we're going to feel that. We're seeing an uptick in crime um, and I think some of that is a direct correlation to what we see in bail reform. And as I learned on the farm, you can either sit around and complain about something that happens or you can do something. And for the last 10 years here in Lewis County, we have held court largely just two mornings per month. I don't believe that's enough to handle the influx and in crime that we're seeing. And um, cases continue to pile up. Uh, they're backing up. And what I want to do is be elected to this position. And one of the first things that I'm going to institute is we're not going to hold criminal court just two mornings a month. We're going to do it every single day, or very nearly every single day. Um, sometimes there will be two sessions a day. There may be a morning session and an afternoon session. Now I'm sure one thing you're thinking is, of course, this position comes with heavy family court responsibilities, uh, but I've looked at the scheduling, I've looked at those numbers. I'm very confident that we can carve out um, an hour and a half, two hours each and every single day to commit to resolving these criminal cases. Um, we need to have arraignments. Um, when an indictment is returned, um, we shouldn't be scheduling an arraignment out two, three, four weeks. We should be looking to arraign that person on that indictment the very next day, or two days. That way we get the case rolling. I'm able to bring a defendant into court, able to have them arraigned, give their defense attorney a schedule for motions, which will be due in 45 days. It will not be due in three months, four months, five months. Criminal procedure law dictates you have 45 days to file your motion. On day 45, I will expect the defense attorney to be back in my courtroom with their motions in hand. We'll then schedule any hearings that are necessary. Ultimately, the goal of all of this scheduling will be to resolve each and every case within six months of indictment. I think that that's critically important, not only to hold criminals accountable for their behavior, uh, but also keep our community safe. And again, I think moving forward, this will allow me to have court over 220 times a year, not just 24. Um, because when we're moving these cases, we have to move them as efficiently and effectively as we can. And that's the best way to protect this community about some of the changes that we've seen in bail reform. Because there's no doubt that we're seeing a recidivism in crime. And I think that some of that is definitely attributed to bail reform as these individuals who would have previously been not held in custody they're no longer being held in custody. So that's one of the major changes that I want to make. And I want to apply that across the board because in family court there are, I think there are a number of different ways to move cases more efficiently and effectively, um, especially if 
we're holding attorneys accountable for their time. Um, these attorneys, uh, we've created somewhat of a perverse uh, pay structure for many of the assigned attorneys in family court and criminal court cases, which is the longer that a case goes on, there's more potential money for a candidate. They can bill more hours, they can you know, do various things like that. If we're resolving cases quicker, um, which is always going to be my goal, um, I know that some of the defense attorneys are going to probably push back on that a little bit, um, but I think that that's one of the best ways that we can, again, not only aid in, in the administration of justice, but um, get better results for people quicker. So that's kind of a, a little bit about what I see as some of the big issues. I'm going to open it up right now to see if you guys have any questions for me, because uh, you've heard me drone on now for about 10, 15 minutes. So uh, can I answer any questions for anybody? Don't all shout out at once. Where do you stand on pistol permits? So that's a great question. Uh, this, pistol, this position is the pistol permit officer. Um, I, in New York State, uh, you have a lawful right if you meet certain criteria, uh, basically that you've never been, you're over the age of 21, you've never been convicted of a serious uh, crime, you have an absolute right to possess a firearm. I believe those pistol permits should be issued efficiently and effectively uh, without any delay, uh, as it's already a time-consuming enough process uh, for the citizens who are going through it. Uh, if I'm elected to this position, one of the first things I'm going to do is sit down with Sheriff Carpinelli and say, what can I do from my position to help you process these permits in a more efficiently and effective manner? That's not to say rushing through the process, but I want to make sure that there's never any holdup from my end if I'm elected to this position. But that's something that I know is very important. Thank you for that question. Any other questions? Uh, I mean that if you if you win after after the election, uh, will you put yourself out there to be the acting Supreme Court justice? And if so, what experiences do you have with being in with the Supreme Court? So the acting Supreme Court designation is a designation which comes from the head of the Fifth Judicial District. In this case, right now, Judge Murphy. So whether or not I'm a, it, you know given that title will be a decision largely made uh, by the Fifth Judicial District. Um, I am happy to take on um, that responsibility. Um, I have experience in a lot of other areas, um, not just, of course, in, in criminal, uh, but I would be happy to take on those responsibilities if the Fifth Judicial District uh, deems that appropriate based on where their caseload is. Um, and that could mean going and covering cases in another jurisdiction criminal. Uh, or family court in a different jurisdiction. It just depends on what the needs are of the 5th Judicial District. What I am going to do, though, is make it very clear to the judges of the 5th Judicial District um, that without question, my focus is here in Lewis County and for the citizens of Lewis County who elected me to this position. So I'll make it very clear to them while I'm happy to participate and help out the 5th Judicial District in whatever manner that I can, my focus is always going to be there. And if that means going down to calling you know, the judges on the phone and being like, this is how much I can handle because I have this number of criminal cases, I have this number of family court cases here in Lewis County, that's what I'm going to do to make sure that they know that my priority is here. I'm happy to help out Herkimer, Oswego, Jefferson, Oneida, and Onondaga County in any way that I can, but certainly not at the expense of the citizens of Lewis County. So, any other questions? Yeah. What do you think your greatest strength is for this position? So I think that the, the biggest asset that I, I bring to this position is, is I have experience through over 50 courts throughout the United States, throughout the, not well, the United States federal court, but throughout the courts in New York State. So I've been before dozens and dozens of judges, and I've seen a lot of what works, a lot of what doesn't work. Uh, I've been in some courtrooms that were run extremely efficiently, um, and some that were not run so efficiently. And I've been paying attention, uh, and I want to emulate what I saw in those judges that was so uh, respectable and efficient, and I want to incorporate that into my own experience if I'm honored and elected to this position. 
and incorporate that. But my experience in a multitude of other jurisdictions I think is a great asset to bring back to Lewis County because I'm extremely familiar with the courts here and what you know is a reasonable and good outcome for the citizens of Lewis County, but also some of the uh, time-saving and court-efficient measures that have been put in place in other jurisdictions. I'm very excited to bring some of those here to Lewis County. Being that, there, being that if you're elected, you're going to be in charge of three courts, mm -hmm. um, all being a major part of, of what you're going to preside over. Um, what experience do you have with family court and service court, and how will you handle that? So uh, family court, uh, when I first got out of law school, um, I worked for a period of time at the Hiscock Legal Aid Society in Syracuse and was assigned um, at the time I thought very unfortunately to the family court position because what I was really hoping for was to do criminal court and hopefully join the Onondaga County DA's office, which I was able to do just about 10 years later than I was hoping to. But um, so I gained a lot of experience in, in family court there, um, you know, handling Article 6 proceedings, Article 10 proceedings, you know, so neglect petitions. Um, and it was really a great experience because I saw it um, from oftentimes, you know, both the petitioner and the respondent's point of view. So, you know, in a neglect petition, you're dealing with, you know, DSS largely. They, they file a neglect petition, so you know they were representing you know the parent who that had child had been you know in the custody of. So seeing it from those perspectives, I think it's really helpful um, experience. Um, you know, obviously the bulk of my experience has been handling uh, felony criminal cases, serious felony criminal cases. Uh, but ultimately, when you go into family court, uh, the core of most of the decisions that you make are. Uh, what's in the best interest of your of this child and that's largely an investigation and that I have a lot of experience in conducting you know the different determinations that are being made you know when I was at the US Attorney's Office or in Onondaga County or here in Lewis County as a prosecutor of course I'm making a determination was there criminal conduct um, and if so what was that criminal conduct but in, in family court a lot of your proceedings are focused right around that what's in the best interest of the child, whether that's in revisiting some kind of custody arrangement or whether that's in the form of a neglect petition. And I have a lot of confidence in my ability to, uh, as judge, be at the head of that investigation and make determinations as to what will be in the best interest of the child, listening to all the parties involved, uh, whether that be you know the parents, of course, uh, DSS, um, any experts that DSS, of course, enlisted, school counselors, teachers, those kind of things. And so. the surrogates? So surrogates court um, is, is something, you know, as you're aware, you know, it, it deals a lot with guardianship issues and also the settling of estates. Um, the settling of estates is, um, you know, largely dependent upon your circumstances. Is the individual, uh, do they have a will or do they not have a will? Um, that really dictates which way path we go down with, you know, how we're going to disperse assets, locating, you know, family members, those kind of things. Uh, guardianship uh, usually is dealing with very sad c circumstances of individuals who may not be able to take care of themselves and make decisions any longer. Uh, but again, you know, going back to kind of my, you know, investigative experience as to how to handle those situations and make that determination. Um, and I've always been able to, throughout my career, adapt um, and learn uh, areas of the law. Um, and uh, surrogates court is one of those areas where I have not had a lot of experience with. Um, there's really no way of sugarcoating that, but I'm confident in my ability to um, make those determinations and execute um, in those courts. Any other questions? They don't have to be legal questions, fun questions. Uh, I had one more, but it's oh, kind of awesome! Tough no, one. no, no. No, I understand. You I, don't, I can answer I, questions. I understand you don't reside in the, the county. Okay. Um, can I ask where you reside and where your family resides? Being that this is a position that pays, the taxpayers pay you over 200000 a year. Okay. 
it's it's a more of an investment in our community. Sure. Knowing sure. that somebody within our community yep. is presiding over our community. Yeah. No. Absolutely. That's a that's a fair question. <laughs> Um, so where I reside currently, um, I reside in Beaver Falls. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of family in the area. Um, my dad has several properties, uh, so I utilize one of those properties. Um, I still, you know, um, anybody can do a search. I still own a home in Baldwinsville, um, which I'm hoping, you know, we'll be able to be in a position to sell very shortly um, because it's always been my goal uh, this is where I grew up. This Lewis County is in my DNA. Um, I have always wanted to be able to see my parents' house from my house. Um, which that's something that's very important to me. Um, fortunately, I'm in a position because of my father that I'll be able to do that. Um, we have not um, put forward really any plans to move forward with that because I've been quite honestly, very, very busy with this campaign. And the position here in Lewis County opened up much sooner uh, than I had anticipated. I did not believe when I had formulated the plans to run for this position that I would be able to do it as an employee of Lewis County. I thought I would still be working in another jurisdiction. Fortunately for me, that wasn't the case. Um, that was really just dumb luck. Um, but that's my goal is to, uh, when this campaign is over, win, lose, or draw to begin construction on that house over in Beaver Falls. Um, the guy that I will be purchasing the land from is kind of a pain, um, but I think you know family relationships will, uh, will prevail and he'll you know, let me begin construction on it. Um, but it's just been such a hectic time that I haven't really been moving forward with it because I just don't have really the time I'm out till almost 7.30 every night uh, knocking on doors and things like that. So, um, and it was never really anticipated that even I would be able to be a employee of Lewis County. So, um, but yeah, I, I do, um, this, is, this is where I'm going to be. And that, that's when lose or draw. So, um, although I don't think a draw is really like a likely scenario, but, but win or lose. So I hope that kind of answers your question yeah, a little bit. So your, your family's still in Baldwinsville, going, living and going to school and things like that? So I have two children, mm -hmm. um, Jack and Riley. Jack Riley, I know you're not watching this, but on um, <laughs> the off chance that you stumble upon it years from now, um, I just want to say I'm so proud of you, um, and I am divorced. I don't know if anybody knows that, but I'm divorced, um, and, um, and remarried. And remarried. <laughs> <laughs> yes, divorced and remarried. Um, my um, Jack and Riley, my boys, their mother, she resides in Syracuse. The boys have spent almost, gosh, eight years in that school district. Um, my oldest, I will say, is, uh, is there ever a day he's not playing soccer? No, uh, okay. we're talking about it. So he's very heavily involved. He's a sophomore. He's on the varsity soccer team. Jack, again, I couldn't be more proud of you. Um, I, I really don't think that there's any chance that he is going to return to the area, unfortunately, to compete. He very much wants to finish school with his friends, and he'll be a junior next year. Um, Riley, I don't really know about, but what I would ask the voters is that uh, Stacy, my ex-wife, and I have maintained, I think, a very great co-parenting relationship, um, and I think that's really where they go to school would be our decision. But in all likelihood, I think really they're going to remain at the CNS district. They both expressed that, um, and again, I, I think as, as, as a parent, I think most people can relate to not wanting to displace a child, certainly. Uh, who's coming up in his junior year and very much competing in sports, especially when, you know, one parent lives, you know, within three miles of the school that they attend. So, but that's a decision that, uh, you know, um, the four of us, Stacy and her husband and me and my wife will, will work out. So, yeah. So bail reform, you said, was a major thing for you when you, if you get the office. So I was under the understanding that bail reform kind of had judges' hands tied. So how are you, as one judge or potential judge, going to 
how are you going to change that if you're happy? You know, yeah, yeah. That, New York that's, State is the ruler, right? Yes, bail reform comes from the legislature. And there's nothing that I can do except, you know, if elected to the position, I'm certainly going to engage with legislators. Um, I think what New York State should do is adopt a federal standard, uh, which federal judges are mandated to consider whether or not an individual charged with a crime is a danger to themselves or anyone else in the community. So this decision is made in federal courts all day, every single day. I think that New York State should implement a, a similar policy. I think it would turn decisions back over to the judges who are in the best position to make them based on the circumstances they see. I think we've already kind of seen some of the dangers of legislation across the board. Um, so I'm certainly going to lobby those for those changes, but you're right, um, those changes come, and which is why I think holding court more than two mornings a month is critically important. Because if you look at the statistics, it takes four to five appearances oftentimes to resolve a criminal case. And if you have those four or five appearances in a 14 month period, or do you have them in a four month period? And that's why I want to hold court every single day for these criminal cases, <coughs> because I want to have that, those four or five appearances, because it's going to take a number of appearances to resolve a criminal court case. And if I can shrink the time frame down, which is very, is very doable, mm -hmm. then we can resolve these cases quicker. And instead of having an individual having, say, 14 months to commit crimes, they have six. So it's not going to totally fix the problem, but again, I think it's better than sitting around and doing nothing. Any other questions? Nobody's thrown anything at me yet, so that's a good thing. Because we're on camera. Oh, yes. Well, he's not really watching the crowd, per se. You could probably throw something, and there'd just be one lawyer to testify as to who threw it. So I don't think that that's really uh, likely. Any other questions? Oh. Drug court. Do you drug have any experience with, with drug court? How would you handle, handle those cases? Yes. So drug court is. Um, so for those people who may not be familiar, Drug Court is a program that's been instituted in every jurisdiction throughout New York State. Um, and it is a program, it's essentially one of the many diversionary courts um, that New York State has. It's a program where people enter into um, who have substance abuse issues. Uh, the idea being a very simple one, that if there is an addict who has committed crimes, uh, nonviolent crimes, um, then they could go into treatment, and if they recover from their addiction, then they may not commit crimes in the future. It's essentially an alternative to incarceration. So when I was here in Lewis County, um, I was the ADA who covered drug court, so I have extensive experience sitting through uh, and listening to uh, counselors. Um, and when I was in Onondaga County, as in my role as Bureau Chief uh, of the Investigation and Narcotics Bureau, I had to sign off on everybody who went to the Syracuse, the Treatment Court program. Um, so I'm very familiar with the screening process, which looks a lot different here in Lewis County than it does in Onondaga County. Um, on a, uh, Lewis County accepts uh, a lot of driving while intoxicated offenses. Those don't go to treatment court in Onondaga County because of size. Um, but the, the drug court program is one of the programs that I think has suffered uh, in the last 10 years. Um, a drug court program that drug court used to meet uh, in person every single week uh, and it was a great way for the judge to bring all the participants in on a very regular basis and, and there's something to be said about if you're on the program and you have to come in at least once a week and talk to the judge face to face and update them on your progress whether or not you went to um, your meetings your self-helps if you missed a counseling session like I think it really helped keep people. Uh, so uh, right now, Drug Court is meeting uh, at most twice a month again. Um, I'm definitely going to institute the once again in person, one time, once a week in person meeting of the Drug Court program. 
uh, because I think that's a really beneficial program here in Lewis County, in particular to those who have committed driving while intoxicated offenses and the substance abuse that they can get help with, really helping them. Um, some of the biggest success stories that I've seen as a prosecutor have come out of that treatment program, um, in particular uh, here in Lewis County, um, you know, before I left here with the, the drinking and driving offenses, because those are people who really can turn their lives around. And it makes such a huge difference, not only for the community, um, who's no longer at risk of, of somebody operating a vehicle under the influence on the roads, but their, their family lives improve so much. They, they build better relationships with their children. Um, it's a great program when used under the right circumstances. Obviously, a big part of that program is listening to the folks who know about treatment because I don't have a bunch of letters after my name. Uh, but the people who are there kind of counseling the judge, so that I think is a big portion of it. So take that one step further. What are you willing to do in family court? Because there are multiple families that suffer from addictions, mental health, and their children are removed or in kin gap, or kin gap and services are not being put in place, or they're not being put in place and monitored on a regular basis, because in family court, I believe it's once every six months they have to see the case, where in family court it's once a week. So what are you willing to do to bring family treatment court back to Lewis County? Well, I, I think that, um, I, I'll be totally honest with the question asker, I didn't know that uh, when I was here in Lewis County, uh, before I came back in 2021, uh, family court cases were always part of the drug court program. Uh, I only knew that it had dwindled down to three participants now. Uh, when I was here, the first time it averaged right around 15 to 18 participants at one time. Um, the family uh, side of that was part of it, um, so I didn't realize that that had been eliminated. Um, that's something obviously that has not, if it's not being utilized anymore, is something that I will be utilizing. Uh, because it's an excellent tool in cases of, uh, especially where there's been neglect petitions filed. Um, there are a lot of parents uh, who suffer from addictions and they may not have ventured into criminal behavior, um, but obviously um, they're suffering with addictions. And from the family court side of things, I think it's, a, it's an invaluable tool to, um, to use to kind of put families back together and have a child have an active participant present parent um, so that's something that I would absolutely be looking to do because again it, it um, course correlates right with the cor correlates. correlates thank you <laughs> thank you to my wife correlates right along with the criminal and you can do them handle them both in the same appearance um, you know in one court session once a week You know what I should have done is get some water. That's what I should have looked up here with maybe some water. Any other questions? I, if there's no questions, I'm going to ramble on. I really appreciate um, everybody coming out here tonight. Again, I think this is the most important uh, decision that Lewis County voters have to make. Uh, this is a 10-year term. Uh, so this election is going gonna, is gonna to kind of dictate the, the direction uh, that the courts go for the next 10 years. Um, and I really think that given the circumstances and the situation that we're in, it's really time for a change, a change in uh, you know, the frequency that we hold court, uh, the change in uh, the way we handle court. And um, I really appreciate everybody coming out. If I can answer any questions you want to ask me privately, I'm not going anywhere. Do you, do you have a question? Yeah, can yeah. I ask a question? Yeah, of course, Shirley. Yeah. So yeah. Julie from the Water Company <laughs> Times. With changing the schedule, going back a little bit, and you've spoken mm -hmm. about this, and we've spoken about it a lot, for a couple hours every day at least to have court, criminal mm -hmm. court every day, what will that do to family court? which is also we're currently happening every day. Like the, the other courts as well need your time and then paperwork. <laughs> Who knows how long that will take, right? So will it slow down other courts to speed up criminal court, do you think? No, it, it's definitely not gonna slow it down at all. And, and in fact, it's gonna have the opposite effect. Um, because if you are 
again, it, it always is going to take four to five, usually the statistics bear this out, that four to five appearances to resolve a criminal court case. Um, what, the one thing I really want to do is eliminate both on the family court side and the criminal side is what I would call kind of wasted court appearances, which are you come in, you're assigned to your attorney, and then you just go home. Well, that, that doesn't get us anywhere, especially in a family court setting where we could be revisiting a custodial agreement. Like, have there been any significant changes in this uh, petition? And if so, is there a resolution? And that could be, you know, attorney A, attorney B, you take a minute, go talk to your clients, okay? I'm going to handle these three criminal court cases, okay? And then I'm gonna come back to this one in half an hour, an hour, after you guys have had a chance to talk to your attorney. Maybe we can resolve a, a family court in one appearance. Um, and then I can deal with these three criminal cases in that time. Also, a lot of this is going to be, one of the big things that I wanna do with scheduling is, and I, I think that this was very effective, is conferencing cases uh, with the district attorney's office and with defense lawyers. This is a practice that's went away in the last 10 years, uh, but in my experience, it's always beneficial um, when you can get all three parties around the table um, and, and sometimes uh, having the third party, the neutral party, the judge, really is able to facilitate um, a resolution to a criminal case. Uh, as a prosecutor, um, somebody who's been working with law enforcement and fighting for victims, I sometimes can become, I guess, a little entrenched in my position, is how I'll say it, like politically correct. Um, and I don't always necessarily see another side. And sometimes having the judge there is very helpful to show you that there is another side, but you have to get around the table and talk. Um, because a lot of times the parties won't talk unless they're forced to. And by scheduling regular conferences on, you know, these three or four cases, you know, because, you know, we can say to, the judge here can say to, you know, the Lewis defenders who handles the overwhelming majority of criminal cases, like, hey, you know, you and Ms. Mosher come over here at 12 o'clock and we're gonna conference these five cases. Um, as far as a lot of the paperwork, there is a lot of paperwork um, to do. A judge should be, should be staying up on relevant case law, should be reading decisions from the appellate department, um, should be reviewing all that paperwork. That's on my time. That's not on the 8.30 to 4.30. That's where I'm supposed to be in court. Uh, my wife is gonna have to deal with me doing that side of the job. Um, that I'm gonna be sitting on the couch reading you know, those cases going over them. So that's something that I don't think should be handled between 8.30 and 4.30. This isn't a 35 to 40 hour a week job. It's just not by its very nature. Um, it requires a lot of reading in the off time uh, as far as the paperwork goes. But no, I don't think anything is going to be, is going to be suffering um, as far as time goes. Um, you know, we have the building until four, and that's only because, you know, the security has to be there and they're state workers and we can't pay them overtime without blessing from the governor, I guess. So, but we have the building until four and I, and I intend to utilize it till four o'clock every day. Thank you. Now, there's a lot of unforeseen, and I know you've been talking a lot about scheduling things like mm -hmm. that. But unforeseen with with different parties in cases, especially in family court, yeah. along with attorneys, scheduling, and everything else that goes with it. If you cannot reach your goals if elected, how will you how you how will you handle it? Um, I know there are a lot of unforeseen, and I think the unforeseen um, really present themselves in family court. So, as, as you're probably aware, there are a number of family court situations which will require me to drop everything, okay? And I think that this is one of the most critical reasons as to why criminal court needs to be scheduled so much more frequently. Because with our current every other Friday, uh, two times per month, the morning schedule, we're trying to schedule, say, 20 to maybe 25 cases for that Friday morning. And if we don't get to those cases that time, we have to kick them all out, maybe two weeks a month. 
what I want to do because those emergencies are going to happen. There's going to become a time where as the family court judge in particular, I'm going to have to drop everything on my calendar to hear a case in family court. What I want to do is make sure that one of those emergencies never delays 25 criminal cases. What I want is to have an hour and a half where I've scheduled five, six, seven cases, and then I only have to kick them out one day. Or maybe I kick them out two or three days, but I don't have to kick them out two weeks to a month. And I think that those emergencies are the real reason why this scheduling becomes so important because when you do have that scheduling, now you're trying to reschedule 25 cases instead of trying to reschedule five, six, seven cases, should it fall on one of those Fridays. And you're already gonna have to schedule the family court appearances, the pistol permits who may have come up that day. And that's why I wanna do it far more frequently. So nobody's wait, so no defendant, no victim is waiting another month for the sentencing of an individual to take place. Um, as far as the goals, if, if I'm not meeting them initially, um, I'm just gonna work harder at it. We're gonna, I'm gonna figure out how to do it better. Uh, because I really believe that this can be done. Um, there are a number of courts in this, in, in this state and in this district that are meeting these six month goals. Um, so if I'm not, then I'm gonna sit down with some of these other judges and I'm gonna lean on them and I'm gonna say, you know, judge so-and-so, how are you doing this? How, how, what can I do differently? Because I must be missing something because I'm not quite hitting my mark. So if, if I'm not, that, that's what I'm gonna do is go to somebody who is and be like, how do you do it? Teach me. So I came like, how, and if this is asked, I apologize. How much does it cost an inmate to be incarcerated for one day? Is it still 130? I don't have the, ex I, I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but I think it's like around $100, $115 a day. So if you run courts every two weeks, and they have to stay incarcerated during that how, that time period, and then they get pushed off. How much are you costing the county to sit there? Well, I, the 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 individuals who are being held, they'll kind of be held to say, I'm not very good at math, so I, I don't know what the exact number would be. Um, but many of the cases that I'm looking to schedule, I mean, not only are the ones incarcerated, but I really want to make sure that the people who are not in custody, who are no longer being held on bail, are coming into court far more frequently so that they're seeing me and remembering, hey, I have a criminal case pending and I'm going to have to go see the judge real soon. So I don't know the exact cost of that, um, but there is, you know, obviously there's a cost in housing somebody here locally. Hopefully we can get the cases resolved and if the person is going into state prison, then the tax burden would be the cost of their incarceration would be shared with all of the New York State taxpayers, not just on uh, Lewis County. I hope that answers your question. All right. Any other questions from anybody? Okay. Uh, happy to answer any questions that you wanted to ask privately or any. You know, I'll be here. I'm not going anywhere for a while. Just want to say thank you, Nick, for live streaming this. Julie, thank you for coming. Uh, I appreciate um, not near as much as I appreciate all of you coming, uh, but thank you for coming, listening to me. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it.